Wan from Youth for Animals. Youth for Animals is a platform for young people who are against animal cruelty and for animal protection. As you may know, we are pursuing a campaign for the release of Shunker, an African elephant at the Delhi Zoo who has been solitary for 16 years. In fact, there are over 2,600 elephants in, cap in India in captivity who are either in zoos or under private ownership for entertainment purposes. We thought that it was important that we raise our voices on this, and it is in that context that we have a special guest, Ms. Sangeeta Iyer. Ms. Iyer is a National Geographic Explorer. She's the founder of Voice for Asian Elephant Society. She is an award-winning uh, wildlife filmmaker and also a biologist. Miss um, Iyer, thank you for taking your time out today. We're really happy to have you here. Well, thank you for having me. And I just want to say I'm so proud of you, young people, because you are, you know, our future. So I'm really, really excited uh, for this half hour that we're going to chat and try and identify, you know, whatever challenges as well as solutions. Right. Yeah. And we know that you've worked actively on elephant welfare. We know that you care deeply about it, of course. So just to start with, can you share what inspired you to advocate for elephants and start a uh, voice for Asian Elephant Society? And what do you guys do in general? Yeah, so it all began in um, 2013 when I was in India uh, to attend my father's first you know, death anniversary. And I visited Kerala at the time and I was appalled to see how these elephants, the so-called festival elephants or temple elephants are being exploited um, behind the insidious veil of culture and religion. As we know in India, we talk about ahimsa. Ahimsa is nonviolence, but everything being inflicted upon these innocent mute animals were nothing but violent. I saw elephants with massive tumors on their hips, blood, you know, dripping out of their ankle muscles because the chains were cutting right into their flesh, tears flowing down their face. And so I, I felt I needed to do something. And right then and there, I, I, being a camera person, being a wildlife filmmaker, I started filming voraciously and I gathered about 25 hours of footage. I didn't know what to do with that. And then after I returned, I used to be a broadcaster in my previous life. So I contacted my media colleagues and they said, just launch a crowdsourcing campaign. I did that and we raised a significant amount of money enough to produce this United Nations nominated and multiple award-winning film, Gods and Shackles. I never would have thought all that would have happened, but I pursued what my heart called me to do. Then I felt that this is not good enough. Creating awareness is a great thing, but it's just not good enough. And I needed to do more where we can have projects that can help elephants, wild as well as captive, but starting with captivity. And then you know, that's how I got started with this Voice for Asian Elephant Society with a mission to protect the endangered Asian elephants of India in particular. Number one, because I was born and raised there. I have a close cultural bond with um, elephants in particular, right from the age of three. My grandparents used to take me to this temple where I had a very deep bond with um, one of the Tuskers and the Mahouts would just leave me with him to play but that's how my, my deep bond with these elephants developed. Little did I know at the time that I would still continue to work in a manner that would hopefully unshackle them. I think that's definitely very inspiring. And uh, I've seen the work that your organization is doing and it's a range of things, you know, from um, conflicts with humans to captivity. And I found those projects really interesting. Uh, so, you know, you've done various projects also on rehabilitation and captivity, and I believe you've also had interviews with several scientists. So can you share some of your key insights on um, from your research and projects on elephant captivity? Oh, absolutely. Actually, I have uh, even interviewed quite a few uh, scientists, you know, uh, for my National Geographic 26-part uh, short docu-series called Asian Elephants 101. 
And it's not just the physical suffering, but the emotional and the psychological suffering these animals endure is just beyond anybody's comprehension. They suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder. And what that means is that they're either, you know, um, hypersensitive to a situation where if anybody comes near them, they're like, oh, somebody's going to hit me, or they become aggressive. Like the, the minutes they think that another person is coming anywhere near, they get aggressive. And then people start blaming them. But this is the consequence of, you know, the post-traumatic stress disorder that they suffer from. And the thing is, elephants are highly intelligent and incredibly social animals. The way they live their lives, they wander across vast areas for hours on end, 16 to 18 hours a day. They need to do this in order to, you know, gather nutritional, um, make sure that they have enough nutritional diet because they consume approximately 200 to 300 pounds of fodder of various you know, grass, even mud, barks, you know, leaves, branches. This is, they're pure vegans and they need different variety to supplement their, you know, proper diet. So when they're held in captivity, they don't have any social interactions. They don't get the kind of food that they deserve to eat in order to balance you know, their nutritional needs, but beyond that, they need to exercise because their bodies are massive. And it's like these four legs of theirs are like four pillars that hold the whole weight of this massive, you know, animal. And if it doesn't keep exercising constantly, it starts suffering. I mean, the elephant starts suffering from serious arthritis and they get foot rot because they're forced to stand on their own urine and excrement. And they go crazy literally because they're, like I said, they're so intelligent and they know they always want to create tools. They always want to be engaged, not just socially, but keep doing things like us human beings. Can you imagine being you know, locked up in a room not being able to talk to any of your friends, no social media connection, no telephone connection. How will humans feel? And you're just given one kind of food like bread and peanut butter and jam for afternoon, lunch, dinner, breakfast, everything. That's what elephants get. They get only one kind of food or maybe two different varieties of food. It's all, all in all, like physically, emotionally, and psychologically, they become so distressed. And that's why they react the way they do. They suffer from something called foot rot, which, you know, which become deadly diseases. Tuberculosis, 25% of captive elephants in Kerala, they suffer from tuberculosis. And why tuberculosis is infected because of these kinds of unhygienic areas where they are forced to stand, whereas in the wild, as I said, they wander across vast areas. But even, even beyond that, the ecological significance of these elephants is beyond anybody's comprehension. When they wander across vast areas, they disperse seeds in their dung, seeds become trees, and trees give us oxygen to breathe and take up the carbon dioxide that we put out in the atmosphere. That's how they play a very significant role in the forest ecosystems. They create pathways for various species that lead them to water holes. So, I mean, I can go on and on about the ecological significance and about their suffering in captivity, but the bottom line is they belong in the wild, not in captivity. No, yeah, I think you make a really good point about how their captivity impacts us as well, because essentially there is that balance in nature and every animal does provide something. So I think what you mentioned is a really good point. And yeah, I read a lot about those foot diseases, you know, walking on the concrete floor. And also in the festivals you mentioned, there's a lot of noise and they're fully embellished in these very like heavy ornaments. Yeah. And um, it sounds terrible. And what you were talking about for their mental health, I think it's definitely important to also like show similarities with humans because their brains are pretty similar to ours in the sense that it's social. And um, I'd read some scientific study that said that their 
in captivity, the cerebral cortex or capillaries, they actually reduce or become less complex and that is not good for their memory and information processing skills. So I definitely agree with everything you said. Yeah, um, and, so and then, sorry, I just wanted to mention something about the festivities, right? They are not only uh, paraded for hours on end beneath the scorching sun in Kerala, it's extremely hot, but they're also deprived of the basic necessities water, food, rest, they don't get any of that, right? Can you imagine a hungry elephant, starving, thirsty elephant, just desperate to drink some water, just begging and pleading, please give me some water. And they have real soft foot pads. So when they walk on hot tar roads, it, can you imagine walking bare feet on the hot tar roads? and the tar getting stuck to your feet. When you look at their, under, beneath their feet, it's all black and it's, it's just horrendous what they go through. And with regards to the elephant brain, they have, their brains are three times as large as human brains, you know, and they are so reflective. Their prefrontal cortex is so incredibly evolved. They are reflective. They are self-aware beings. All these things have been proven scientifically. And what a heinous crime against nature it is to keep them in captivity. Yeah, yeah. Uh, for the festivities, I had seen a video of the fireworks in Kerala, and they were like people were able to cover their ears, but you know the elephants weren't able to, and that was just really saddening. Um, yeah, that was in my film Gods and Shackles. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. I'm glad you watched it, but it's heartbreaking, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And what you said about self awareness. Um, there was the study about Happy the Elephant passing the mirror test. So that just, again, reinforces how intelligent elephants are. And, and you know, she's there's- still in captivity. I know. still in captivity, although they're fighting so hard to get her into a sanctuary. So yeah, even though there's enough scientific evidence, there's just this incredible resistance to doing the right thing, not only in India, but around the world, but in particular among these cultural and festival you know, owners like who mint money out of leasing them out as though they are commodities, you know, and yeah. still not give them the basic necessities, although they are, elephants are minting them a lot of money, but even their basic needs are not being met. Yeah, yeah, and that kind of relates to my next question on, you know, I was wondering why are legislations in India and people in power still resisting this very clear scientific evidence? And what do you think are the solutions to kind of bridge this disconnect that we're seeing in India? Yes, yeah, so those are two very important questions, but they're two separate questions. So let me answer the first one. The resistance part, okay, so you know how India is so culturally sort of brainwashed. Right. So there are certain cultural uh, misbeliefs and myths that people still hold on to. So right there, there needs to be significant awareness that needs to be raised in terms of at least changing the public perception of elephants. But when it comes to legislators, they entirely depend on the public because they need votes and elephants cannot vote. And so it is as simple as that. When there are cultural and religious sentiments that are being raised, no politician wants to touch the issue. So there's this denial and denial and denial. This is where the work that you are doing, the work that Voice for Asian Elephant Society is doing, the work, for, the work that all activists are doing around the world and in India in particular, even though we will be constantly intimidated, we have to stay the course. We, uh, the best, our best um, hope is the public itself. Because once we change their mindset and thinking, then we can understand, we can help them understand that, okay, well, now that you understand these are the issues, vote for those who actually prohibit elephant cruelty. And even in this regard, like educating and empowering them constantly, it has to be constant because, you know, the cultural misbeliefs have been instilled in their heads for decades. So it's going to take some time for them to have a different way of thinking. The minute the public understands that festivals are not good for elephants, 
there will be an outcry. It is already happening in Kerala. It is already happening in Tamil Nadu. And even the Tamil Nadu Madras High Court judges have issued certain orders that you know, captive elephants are not cool, right? I mean, it's not cool to keep yeah. elephants in captivity. In Kerala, I have just recently, we have recently launched a legal uh, campaign. And I think there's gonna be some news coverage regarding that next week. That is like the week, I mean, Monday, Tuesday coming up. And it'll really expose a lot of things. And the judges are open now, even in Kerala, to listen to these problems. A lot of judges have seen gods in shackles. And so the justice system, that is a legal system, then the legislators, the policy makers, the decision makers, politicians, all of them need to understand. In order for them to understand, we need to educate. And when they understand, they will do the right thing. At least that's what my hope is. Mm -hmm. Then with regards to solutions, so awareness and education is a no-brainer. It, it has to be done. And mm -hmm. solutions, I mean, one of the things, greatest challenges that India faces is inadequate space. There, you know, we have 1.4 billion people living in India. And there's, there's such incredible competition for space between people and wildlife. And there's always this constant human elephant conflict. And so they use that as an excuse to capture elephants and then exploit them in festivals or in, you know, keep them in zoos and whatnot. At the end of the day, what is really important is that even if, you know, elephants cannot be, um, I mean, there's not enough space. I believe we can create enough space uh, along the forest fringes where we can, I mean, according to the Central Zoo Authority, each elephant needs a minimum of two acre space. And if we can provide that space for 26 or the 2,600 captive elephants in India, and if each of us, like there are so many wealthy Indian people, Indian citizens who own plantations, of, you know, the tea plantations, coffee plantations, and on and on and on. Some of them, even inside the forest, even legally permitted in the past, I don't know, some 50 years ago in Kerala, for instance, that there has to be some sense of people coming to consciousness and saying, we cannot afford to be so selfish and generously offer up space. And so we can create sanctuaries, even if it is a two acre plot of land and allow elephants to roam in that two acre plot of land, a plot of land, excuse me, chain free, give them enough fodder, give them, you know, a wide variety of fodder. This is possible. It is happening in many parts around the world. And, you know, these same owners who have so much money, they can dedicate certain amount of money and still make money by using these elephants, but in a compassionate manner. It doesn't have to be cruel. You know, yes, we understand it takes a lot of money for them to take care of elephants. You need lots of food, you need, they're high maintenance animals, so they shouldn't be captured in the first place. Leave them alone, they'll take care of themselves. But now that you've brought them in captivity, it is our moral imperative to make sure that these elephants are given everything they need and they deserve. And we will continue to fight. We at Voice for Asian Elephant Society, we will collaborate with organizations like yours and we'll continue to do whatever it takes, campaigning, legislative you know, uh, procedures, as well as you know, lobby politicians and say, hey, there are other ways to make money by being compassionate. Even around the world, you know, tourist, um, tourist, uh, tourism companies are saying, we're not going to promote any kind of cruelty you know, when it comes to tourism. <laughs> and so people need to be aware that it is going to impact their pocketbook if they continue to uh, inflict cruelty upon elephants. I hope that answered at least part of your questions. No, yeah, I definitely think the solution de definitely connects to your um, point of raising awareness. I'm just wondering, do you think it would be a possibility to rewild the elephants, like if they're young that have been captured, or do you think it's just better to, you know, keep them in sanctuaries? 
Well, that's a that's a debate. There has been successful rewilding of elephants in places like Kenya, right? The Sheldrick um, uh, Orphanage, for instance. Um, yeah. They have done it so successfully, and there are certain elephants that are being rewilded, even in the Kaziranga National Park, in Assam itself. And among all the states, I must say, regardless of what is going on right now in Assam, they are really trying hard to make sure that you know, wildlife is protected and their captive elephants are much, are way better kept than other captive elephants. The only thing I disagree with them is elephant back rides at the Kaziranga National Park for which I've been lobbying left, right and center and will continue to do so. And so to answer your question, it is possible and it has to be tested and tried. It again depends on whether a herd will accept a baby elephant for instance, even that has happened in places like Tamil Nadu, where when an elephant has fallen inside a well, they release it. And of course, they, you know, the herd accepts the, uh, the, the, the baby elephant. The risk there is because we also have tigers, tigers will target the baby elephants. And the other thing is, if an elephant has been in captivity for decades, that poor elephant will not know how to survive in the wild or I mean, again, this is not anything 100% certain, but I'm just saying that it'll be challenging for it to survive, but then they do have their own wild instincts that could just awaken, right? You never know. This hasn't happened in India, so I don't have a concrete answer for that. No, yeah. Um, so yeah, the reason I ask is because that's been one of our key challenges for uh, rehabilitating Shankar. It's, uh, obviously, it's unique for him since he's an African elephant, but I understand it's a challenge for Asian elephants. So I definitely agree that, you know, working together with other organizations to lobby for those solutions would be really helpful. And, um, you know, you talked a bit about this before, you've done a lot of work by making, you know, gods and shackles and doing other forms of media to raise awareness. So I was wondering, what are some of the obstacles that you face during this journey and how did you overcome them in, you know, animal activism? Wow, yeah, I, I, I've been through the dark nights of my soul. <laughs> As they say, I've cried myself to sleep. It has been challenging for me more emotionally and mentally than even physically. I was involved in a major accident where mm -hmm. I sustained uh, five broken bones and I still have you know, a metal plate that holds my foot and my leg together. And, but I still keep doing the work that you need to do, right? So how do I take care of myself? I have so much faith in God, goddess and all that is. And so I have to wake up in the morning. I have to pray. I have to meditate. I do my yoga. I am a 100% vegan, you know, and um, I drink even black coffee. I don't even drink anything to do with milk. I do what resonates with my soul. And even though there are so many discouraging things happening, the way I, dis did, I release all of them is by spending at least two hours in the wild every single day, whether it is summer, winter, fall, and in, in Canada, winters can be bone chilling, but I still cover myself, I pack myself and I go out. I have to do that because mother nature has such healing powers and we have to have a daily routine to take care of ourselves if we don't take care of ourselves we cannot do the work that we do and with regards to other challenges i've been bullied on social media you know there there are so many bullies and trolls that will who are who want to continue to exploit the elephants and call me an enemy of the culture frankly i i don't think they follow the culture as well as even i do because I believe like Mondays, I worship Lord Shiva. On Tuesdays, I worship all of the goddesses because, and I worship uh, Lord Ganesha. And then Wednesdays for Lord Krishna. So I have all of these days, I am a, I am a pure Hindu. And Hindu Hinduism talks about, you know, ahimsa, as I mentioned before, non-violence. So all of these temples who are exploiting these elephants, they practice, they preach, 
um, compassion. They preach peace of mind, but their actions simply do not reflect what they preach. So if, if the temples simply practiced what they preached, we would not have to be dealing with what we are dealing with because this you know, kind of nonviolence and love and peace and compassion not only applies to humans, it applies to every single living being because each of them has a significant role to play in the ecosystems, even though humans don't understand, even earthworms, even caterpillars. I pick them up when I'm walking in the nature park and I put them on the tree so nobody steps over them. I take care as best as I can, as as best no, yeah. yeah yeah i think that's really commendable and your work is your persistence is incredible i think part of being an animal activist is remembering you know the reason you're truly there for and um you know there's always going to be resistance but i think that you serve as an inspiration to so many young people on how we can Thank keep you. going um so just kind of the last thing i wanted to ask is what would be your message to the youth on how they could raise their voice for any animal conservation, animal activism, anything? What would be your message to them? Exactly what you are doing. Like you are the future of, of our you know, planet and you are the Greta Thunberg of, for the elephants. So we, I am, I can't tell you enough. I'm, I'm getting emotional because when I, when I saw the work that you're doing, I'm like, I, I, I really wish we could have, you know, multiples of, of, of Nikita around the world, you know, to do the work that you're doing. So if there is something that you feel is not right, speak out. Mm -hmm. If you feel that an animal has been, you know, treated cruelly, do something, don't turn a blind eye. There's no time for us to fight and bicker with each uh, between each other. We, there's no time for that because 83% of the wildlife has already perished because of human activities. No questions asked. We make up only 0.02% of the global biomass and yet we've managed to decimate and we're decimating the planet for the future generations like you. So you need to take control and speak out. We need to do media stories. We need to call out the media for not doing their fair share as Greta Thunberg is doing. We need to do this across India. Some of the media outlets are controlled by certain political you know, outfits and we just need to tell them, hey, your job is to be objective, you know, and there's no balance here because the environment is collapsing. Climate change is happening in front of, right in front of our eyes. Hurricanes and storm surges are happening. And if the youth cannot speak out, can you imagine what we, what you will be leaving behind for your children and grandchildren? I will do everything I can to leave a better planet for young people like you. It's my moral obligation. And that's my commitment. I'll fight until I die for you guys. Oh, that's, that's a really good message. And that, that's so inspirational. Um, we're really happy with the work you're doing. And I think one person doing something can inspire a lot of voices. And it all starts with small steps. So um, I wanted to thank you so much for your valuable insights. And I really appreciate you taking out the time. I know you have a busy schedule. You know, you're speaking at COP26 this year, which is a huge privilege. So I wish you all the best of luck with that. Thank um, you. And if and people want to, people want to learn more about our organization, they can just visit vfaes.org. We have several projects happening. You know, we are we are trying to protect wild elephants as well because you know captivity. Um, enforces the reduction of wild elephants, right? We need to make sure the wild elephants are also protected. So we are trying to do captive, um, I mean, projects related to captive and wild elephants. So if people can visit vfas.org, they can get a lot more information and support us in any which way you can. No, yeah, we'll have um, the website link and everything in the description so people can look at it. Um, thank you so much. Thank um, you for the work that you're doing. You're awesome. I love you. You're amazing.